We are right at 7 p.m. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the latest installment of Gardening 101. Today we are joined by Candace DeLong. Candace is the Hampshire County ANR agent and she has a background in tree fruit. So she is the perfect person to give you a bit of an introduction on the um, getting started in tree fruit and small fruit. Just a couple housekeepings if we have some people that haven't been on for the past few sessions. This is webinar format, so you're automatically muted upon entry. No cameras are on, so you don't have to worry about any of that. If you want to ask a question, there's two ways you can do so. You're welcome to type in the chat box. If you do type in the chat, um, you'll see right where you type in your message, there's two. Um, you'll want to change that to all panelists and attendees so then everybody on the call can go ahead and see what's going on in the chat and if we have some discussion you're sharing some experiences we can generate a little bit of discussion in the chat box. You're also welcome to use the Q&A feature. Um, both of those will be at the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring both. So if we don't get to your question right away I promise we're looking at them and we will get to them um, at the end of the presentation. And um, you're also welcome to raise your hand and I can unmute you and you're welcome to go ahead and just say it live. But I'll turn it over to Candace. We'll let her go ahead and get started and take it away. Thank you, Emily. Um, like Emily said, I'm the agent in a and &R agent in Hampshire County. Um, and before that I was what's called an orchard scout in Winchester, Virginia, so pretty close by. Um, and what that means is I basically drove a four wheeler around orchards and looked for bugs and diseases and weeds um, and recorded fruit size and stuff like that. So this topic is uh, pretty fun for me. Um, it's also a really big topic if you think about all the tree and small fruit that there are. So we're gonna talk about some types of tree and small fruit and I'm gonna try not to talk about apples too much. And um, and if you have any questions about other fruits, um, I'm sure we can get you resources for them afterwards. So thanks for having me. Um, so we're gonna talk about tree fruit first um, and break that up into before you plant, um, how to select trees for your orchard or backyard planting and the different things you need to do to maintain that orchard or small planting at your, at your home. And then we're going to talk a little bit about small fruit and focus on blueberries and brambles. <clears throat> so if you're planting a tree fruit orchard, this isn't um, quite as simple as a vegetable garden. And even a vegetable garden is pretty complex, really. But the you will be successful based on how much effort you put into planting this orchard out or this planting out. And, selecting the kinds of trees that you want. And a lot goes into planting an orchard because this is a long-term investment and these trees will last a long time if they're taken care of. So we're gonna talk about before you plant. And this is a picture from when I was um, working in an orchard and my dog got to work in the orchard with me. So this is a picture of her on a planting day when we were planting a new orchard. So that's pretty fun. So the first thing to consider is your site selection. And of course, if you only have a small garden space, you're not gonna have a whole lot of options, which that's okay. You can, you can make a few trees work if you have a small space, but the ideal site for a larger orchard is to have it on rolling or hilly land because of frost protection. So cool air is um, heavier and it's going to sink to the bottom of the hill or a drainage spot. So planting fruit trees on the higher edges of the slope, if you look at this picture, your A or your C, um, that's gonna prevent some cool air damage. Um, I don't know about Emily, but I had a lot of calls this past year, 2020 at the extension office because of frost damage. So you can't really avoid all frost damage, of course, but <clears throat> planting on a slope does help. If you have a Southern place facing slope, it's gonna warm up faster in the spring which is a good thing, it'll get your trees going, but if you have any really late freezes, you'll have to worry about those. And western facing slopes, they can be warmer, but they're also windier, especially my house is that on a western facing slope and it has been very windy, especially yesterday. So that's something to be careful about, especially with young um, 
fragile trees. If you have woods anywhere on your hillside down the slope, they will stop the cold air so it won't drain further down the hill. So that's something to think about. You can actually cut a path through those woods to allow some air to drain through and away from your trees if you need to. <laughs> and um, fruit trees really need full sun. Uh, the best um, tool you have to avoid a lot of diseases and insect problems is to put that tree in full sun and get as much airflow through the tree as you can. So you want full sun six to eight hours a day um, if you have that. Um, for your soils, um, I think you guys have already had a, a class on soil tests. So of course, before planting your orchard, it's helpful to do a soil test. Um, and if you can do this well before you plant, maybe a year in advance, um, that'll help you really improve the soil. <laughs> Sorry, there's a puppy here and it's running around. <laughs> so I'm trying to be quiet. Um, so using a soil test, can really help you improve that soil before you plant. Um, drainage is one of the most important things with apple trees because they don't like wet feet or really any fruit trees. They're not gonna tolerate wet feet. So what you can do to determine how much drainage you have is <clears throat> just dig a hole and fill it with water and determine how fast that water drains out. So if you dig a really deep hole and fill it with water, um, you don't need it to drain out immediately. If it drains within three to four days, you probably have adequate drainage for apples and fruit trees to grow. <clears throat> you don't actually need really excessive soil fertility. Of course, your trees are gonna need nitrogen, but you don't have to have really high loamy levels of soil, of uh, soil fertility. pH, um, needs to be between 6.0 and 6.5. And that's really similar to what your normal vegetable garden would have. So if you want to plant your fruit trees in your vegetable garden and you already have a pH of six, um, your fruit trees will do well there. It helps to consult a soil map. You can look up NRCS soil maps and see kind of the types of soil that you have on your property and maybe figure out the location to plant those trees. <clears throat> If there's any chance, um, I'm assuming you guys are all uh, smaller home orchards, but feel free to correct me or put anything in the chat box. But if you're replacing an existing orchard, um, which there are a lot of new homes in Jefferson and Berkeley County, and there is a lot of old orchards that came out of areas. So maybe you might be on an old orchard site after thinking about it, but um, apple orchards, when you take them out, there are a lot of organisms in the soil that a new apple tree can't handle. So when an orchardist pushes out an orchard, they need they wait like three to five years before they replant it. And they usually plant something like row crops, <clears throat> corn or soybeans, something along those lines to kind of get the soil going and get those organisms out of there before they replant the soil. So you've, if you've had older um, trees on your property and you want to replace them, that's something you could think about before uh, just planting a new tree right into the same hole. Of course, if you're on a really small scale, just moving the hole a few feet would do it. <laughs> you know, just don't plant into the same hole. So if you don't have a lot of options, there are certain species that you could grow to better fit the site that you have in your garden. So apples are, are pretty hardy. <clears throat> they're going to withstand for late frosts and freezes better than something like a peach, a nectarine, cherries, or apricots. So apricots and cherries both usually bloom really early, and they're going to be very susceptible to late freezes and frosts. Um, I know sometimes you'll hear about peach orchards that get were completely frozen out. <clears throat> um, so if you decide to only plant stone fruit or peaches, um, be aware that some years you might get a late frost and it might not flower and fruit as often as you'd like. Um, plums are actually hardier than stone fruit. But if you have a slope and you're going to plant your orchard on a slope, if you plant the apples down the slope where the cooler air is going to sink and then you plant your stone fruit at the top of the slope, 
that can maybe save you some problems because the cool air will drain down the slope, protecting some of your more sensitive fruit and leaving your apples at the bottom will both survive better. Um, from working in an orchard, even a very small slope actually makes a big difference. <clears throat> There's a lot of orchards on slopes, especially in Frederick County. We have a lot of hills, of course, Frederick County. The tops of the orchard, when I would check them, uh, they'd be fine. They wouldn't have any disease or any damaged blossoms, but the bottoms, um, there are some years where you wouldn't find any good blossoms because it completely frozen out. And if you're curious, you can tell if a blossom is still good pretty much right after a frost by taking like a pocket knife, cutting it in half, and you'll see like your stigma and style in the, the flower parts, they will actually turn black and that blossom is not gonna turn into an apple. So if you wanna know right away, that's something you can check out. Um, for more site preparation, you wanna remove the weeds and grasses from the rows um, or if you're not gonna plant in rows, you're gonna wanna remove them from the area where you will plant the trees. You can, if you don't have great drainage, you can actually make somewhat of a raised bed for an apple tree and you can use pine bark mulch or other large soil amendments uh, to improve drainage in that raised bed. Before you plant, make sure you adjust your pH, which is why it's helpful to get that soil test done maybe a year in advance. <clears throat> and you don't really need to plant fertilizer at, you don't really need to use fertilizer at planting time because that tree has enough in that new environment to really get going. So it'll be all right for a while. So cover crops, if you have a, a larger area you wanna plant, you could use cover crops. You could do your soil test about a year in advance, till it, plant a cover crop, and just plant your trees right into the cover crop. This would be useful for crops that would winter, cover crops that would winter kill, because your tree will keep growing and your cover crop will stop in the winter. Um, for a couple years at the orchard I worked with, I believe we planted winter rye and some clover. Um, so the, the ground had been killed by a herbicide. We actually drilled cover crop seeds. The cover crop came up and then we planted into that cover crop the next spring. Um, and that does, if you have a large orchard plot, that'll help get some of the more undesirable weeds out of the area. And bring in more of your typical grasses stuff that you, you can deal with. So if you're going to have a rather large orchard, it helps have some sort of design. Um, and even if you're gonna have a small one, there are a lot of characteristics to think about when picking your apple trees and what sorts that you wanna grow, your apple trees or any, any type of fruit really. <clears throat> Most, types of tree fruit, they're going to need, you're going to need more than one cultivar. So um, one type of apple, if you plant two honey crisps, those apples will not cross pollinate and you won't get much fruit. So always select more than one type of cultivar. Um, and if you want, you can pick out a bunch of different types of fruit that harvest at different times. So if you want to do cherries, you'll start your harvest in June, um, and then you could pick maybe an apple that harvests in July or some peaches, and then you can move into August, uh, more apples, and then as you get into the fall, you can pick cultivars that fit in that specific harvest date. So for a really carefully planned out orchard, you could have fruit harvesting um, way in the beginning in June, and it can go all the way to October. So there are cultivars that you can choose that would fit every spot in that harvest window. So there are a lot of different options for spacing because tree size and rootstock, um, there is many, many different options. So you can select your trees based on size if you wanted. Um, but we're gonna get into that next. Some things to think about when planting your orchard. Apples and pears, they're usually fertilized at the same time. They have similar insect and disease problems. So 
when they need sprayed or when something needs done with management, it's about the same time of the year. So those could be planted together if you wanted. The same is true for peaches, nectarine, nectarines and plums and other stone fruit. They all have similar diseases, similar insects, and the management needs done at similar times. So putting those types of fruit together um, will save you some time, as well as apples and pears. So I spoke a little bit about pollination. So when you order your trees, this chart is from Adams County Nursery, which is uh, up in Pennsylvania. Most of these catalogs, they have a lot of valuable information for picking out the trees, but they'll also provide information on if a certain type of apple or peach will pollinate another type. So before you select your cultivars, you can check out a chart like this one to determine if pollination, um, if cross pollination will occur between the cultivars that you picked out. So most cultivars don't have any issues. This one large red square is all different types of gala. So there are several different types of gala apple. Um, unlike the grocery store that just says gala, <laughs> there are several different types of gala, but none of the galas will cross pollinate. So you'll need something um, like a Granny Smith or something like that to pollinate your gala. Um, So, sorry, I was reading the chat. The rootstock's in the same row. <laughs> yeah, so a nightmare to maintain. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about rootstocks and their size, but if you have a gigantic tree right next to a very tiny tree, I could see that would be a problem. Thanks, Chuck. Um, the other thing to think about is about pollination is some of your apples will bloom really early maybe beginning of April, if it's warm enough, and some will bloom really late. So you can also find charts that look like this that will tell you when your fruit trees will bloom. So that can help you select two different cultivars <laughs> that bloom at the same time that will make sure and cross pollinate. However, there are, there's usually crab apples around, especially if you live in a more urban area, your neighbor's crab apple can pollinate your apple, um, most likely with no problem. So don't be too concerned about pollination that you don't plant anything because you'll probably find something in around that'll work. Um, somebody asked, is there one like that for cherry trees? Cherry trees have more issues with pollination than apples and there are a bunch of charts out there for cherry trees. So selecting um, selecting your trees. So there are so many different types of fruit trees. So picking out good nursery stock is important. A lot of these nurseries, they will send you trees that are bare rooted. And I would recommend that because if you get a bare rooted plant, you have a lot more cultivars that you can choose from. And usually you have more root stocks you can choose from. <clears throat> of course you can find potted plants at your local box store um, or nursery or whatever. And um, those would be fine. You can't be as picky about the cultivars. And <clears throat> I've found that being picky about the cultivar can really save you a lot of headaches down the road. So I would take the time and find the cultivar that you want and order that tree. So I was looking for trees earlier this week for a school garden project in Hampshire County. And some of these nurseries are completely sold out already, which if you guys have looked for trees, you probably know that. Just like the seeds last year, um, I found a lot of nursery stock for fruit trees and small fruit bushes. It's kind of hard to come by. Um, in fruit trees, if you are a commercial nursery or a commercial apple orchard in the area, you probably plant your trees in early spring but you can plant in the fall as well. There are some benefits to planting in the fall. So this is um, something if you're just a home homeowner, you could definitely experiment with planting in the spring in the fall and see what works best for you. Um, for commercial growers, they have a lot going on in the fall. 
with harvest. Um, and sometimes that takes all fall, so they don't really have time to plant trees. So this is my one slide on apple rootstocks. But this is a very complex topic. There are a lot of different apple rootstocks. So there are some rootstocks that will grow a tree that would grow up to my eye level, and I'm not very tall. <laughs> so it would grow up to my eye level. So I think an M26 is a very, very dwarfing rootstocks, or an M27, and it grows up to my eye level. And then there are what's called a seedling, which is basically what an apple would grow on wild in Asia, <laughs> where it's normally, where it was native to. So there is tiny, tiny trees all the way to tall 30 foot more um, rootstocks. So when you go to order your apple, a lot of the nurseries will give you several options um, for rootstocks. So you'll, they'll tell you, say you wanna buy Golden Delicious, and then you can look at what kind of rootstocks. So when you pick a rootstock, that will determine how far apart your apple should be planted, um, and how far between trees, um, and then how far, if you're doing rows, like an orchard, how far your rows should be. Um, there are different, you'll find, if you look for different extension services and from specialists, sometimes you'll find different recommendations. And that's because just be, because you select a certain rootstock, um, your soil actually impacts how big your tree is gonna grow as well. So it's usually a range, not a perfect number. So that might be something you have to mess with. Some of your really typical rootstocks that you'll find are this um, on the chart here, it's an M less seven. That's a pretty standard tree. If you're just driving around orchards in Jefferson County or Berkeley County, you'll see a lot of M less seven. <clears throat> you'll also see it listed as M seven. The IMLA just means it's certified, it's virus free. The IMLA 111 is a pretty large tree and there are still a lot of trees that large around here in orchards <clears throat> and it's really common. On this slide, there aren't any G rootstocks, but if you see a G on a rootstock, that means Geneva. So that's part of the Cornell breeding program. And those G rootstocks are typically um, they have a lot of disease resistance in them. So they're pretty good. Oh, there are G's on here. So there are, they have a lot of disease resistance. So there's a lot of good qualities in those rootstocks. If you look up a chart with the G rootstocks, it'll tell you which diseases they are resistant to and how big they get. There are some, a lot of the Geneva series are dwarfing and they're not very strong. Um, so these need support, which is, this is part of an apple training system to have smaller trees. Um, and I'm gonna show you a picture of what that looks like. But when you look for rootstocks, some nurseries aren't really gonna give you a lot of details. Um, so you can either find a standard, which is gonna be about 30 foot tall, semi-dwarfing, which is 14 to 22 feet tall, and then dwarfing rootstocks. They'll kind of categorize them like that. <clears throat> um, and you can pick really what works for your area. If you have a big space, you could use your standard trees if you want something small or you want to espalier your tree against a wall or something, you definitely want a dwarfing rootstock. So pick the rootstock based on what you want to do with your garden. So I'm going to just show you some examples. Um, this is actually in Winchester at the research, the Virginia Tech Research Station. And they have, this is what's called a high density tall spindle system. So these are Geneva rootstocks that are planted really close together. Um, and I think these are cider apples, but this has a completely different pruning and training and a completely different system than the big trees that you see in, in a typical orchard around here. So this is a, a Geneva a 41 or something very dwarfing you plant them really close together and then they have to have that support. So you can see in this picture that there's a lot of posts. So if you're a commercial grower, you pay a lot of money to install an orchard like this <clears throat> because you have to, that's a lot of trees per acre. So you're buying thousands of trees per acre and then you're putting in the posts and you're putting up the wire. 
But if you want to do something like this in your backyard with 10 to 20 trees, um, that wouldn't be so bad and it might be kind of fun. Um, plant, apple plantings like this are really common out west in Washington state um, and some in New York. This is a system that Cornell has really pushed the higher density system. So these trees might not last as long as your very big standard root stocks, um, but they're productive and really early compared to just a standard tree. So this would be like your MLA 7 size, somewhere between your MLA 7 and, and MLA 111. So it's just a, a standard tree. A lot of the trees in Jefferson County and Berkeley and, and Hampshire, they're about this size. Um, and then this is, I believe this is a, um, an Imla 111 rootstock, but this is a big tree. It could be a completely standard seedling rootstock. It's a Rhode Island greening. And this, this tree, although you can't really tell from the picture, it was hard to capture it, but I could have climbed to the top of this tree and it would have held me no problem. So this is a really, really big tree. So um, this tree, I mean, and it's, it was over 30 years old when I took this picture. So it's pretty impressive. So when you, cut, when you think about apple rootstocks, um, you have a lot of options. You can really, if you wanna search for the perfect tree, um, which might be difficult, you might have to have them custom graphs, but you could get any size, any size tree in any cultivar you want. Um, it just might be hard to find, but you can do it. So there are a lot of benefits to dwarf rootstocks, as I show you this picture of um, a broken tree. <laughs> that, that happens occasionally. So they bear earlier, typically between three to five years. They're easier to maintain. If you're going to spray your trees and prune them, um, you're going to get really good airflow with dwarf trees because they're just not as big. You're going to get better spray coverage, um, better airflow. Um, and then you don't have to use a ladder, which is a big plus <laughs> when you're harvesting. You don't have to use a ladder. These are going to fit into smaller home landscapes a lot easier than a 30 foot tall, 30 foot wide tree. But of course, they may have poor root acreage. Um, some rootstocks have been known to break at the graft union. So where the rootstock has been grafted to the scion, sometimes they break off. So they definitely need the support that we talked about. <laughs> um, but this could be, I mean, having a tiny little apple in your backyard is pretty cool. So if you want to squeeze an apple in a small space, definitely check out some of those dwarf rootstocks. So for other tree fruit, there are definitely rootstocks. Um, there's not as much variability as there are in apples, but some peach and nectarine rootstocks are the level, the nemagard, which uh, root knot nematodes are a problem often in peaches. So the nemagard is resistant to those nematodes. And controller five and controller nine are dwarfing. Um, So pear rootstocks, you also have a bunch of options. Um, pears are trained a lot like apples, um, but of course you can, there are charts like this available for um, any kind of fruit rootstock. But what's really going to impact what rootstocks you can find are what the nurseries actually carry. Um, but of course you can have small rootstocks and really large rootstocks with pears as well. So even more challenging than picking what rootstock you want to plant is selecting what variety you want to plant. Um, there are some varieties that will do better where we are in West Virginia compared to north in New York or in, in Michigan. Honeycrisp is really, really difficult to grow, actually. Um, I always laugh because it's really expensive and everybody wants Honeycrisp, but Honeycrisp has a lot of problems. It also likes really cool nights in the fall. Um, and we just don't have that around here. However, pink ladies do much, much better um, in West Virginia, um, in Virginia and warmer areas. 
and they will get the taste without the cool nights. So if you want something that's better adapted, a pink lady is definitely better for Southern cultivars. If you're picking, um, trying to decide what variety to plant, you could choose based on what you're gonna use it for. If it's just a fresh eating apple or you wanna make sauce or pies. I know um, Lodi apples, people, I've heard people rave about Lodi applesauce and yellow transparent is another really good sauce apple. And those are both really early harvesting. So if you want apples in July, you could pick low dye or yellow transparent. Um, if you're just doing a small home planting, I think the most important thing is disease resistance. Uh, this is just less work for you. <laughs> it's what, why you should go disease resistant cultivars. So I'm gonna talk about those a little bit. Um, so PRI um, is a group of colleges, um, Purdue, Rutgers, and Illinois, and they have since, I believe, I'm going to have to double check, but it's like they started working on this in 1945. So a long time ago, they started developing disease-resistant cultivars. And the disease they focused on is apple scab. So a lot of these cultivars are resistant to apple scab. They aren't resistant to every disease and there are a lot of diseases. Um, but if you wanna start somewhere and you've never grown an apple before, I would definitely recommend these cultivars. Enterprise is, um, it's really easy to grow. <laughs> I've seen some blocks of Enterprise apples that in a commercial grower world, they were not sprayed often at all and they still looked great. They didn't have any problems. Of course, you're still gonna have insects, but there were no diseases. Um, and compared to some other cultivars, it, it was pretty impressive that an enterprise could do that. So I definitely recommend enterprise for those that haven't ever grown an apple before. Another one, um, Crimson Crisp. If you haven't eaten a Crimson Crisp, you should find some because they're very good. And I know some of our local orchards have them in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, I highly recommend it. And it's also scab resistant. So it's another good one to start with growing at home. Um, and I can send these slides too, so you can see my cultivars. There are some other disease resistant cultivars that are more in the heirloom or heritage category, um, including your yellow transparent. Um, Grimes Golden, which is a West Virginia apple. <clears throat> Ashmead's kernel is more of a, a cider apple, but some of the older um, cultivars that you're not going to find at the grocery store, sometimes they have some disease resistance that just naturally occurs that you could start with. And cider apples seem to be all the rage these days. There's been a lot of research. Um, I know, I think there's a cider planting in Kearneysville. Um, I'm not sure which cultivars are there, but these are good um, cultivars to start with for cider. This is a really big topic. A lot of these topic in itself is um, could be a whole talk. So cider apples would be a good thing to plant if you're interested in that. So for peaches, plums, and nectarines, uh, their disease resistance is a lot harder to come by. There isn't really um, there isn't really a disease resistance for brown rot, and brown rot is a pretty major disease of all of these fruits. Um, and there are some varieties of peaches that are more resistant to bacterial spot, but peaches are, are trickier um, to do in the home planting <clears throat> just because you can't outsmart any diseases with resistant cultivars. So you'll just, you really have to take care of these guys to keep them going. So here are some suggestions for peach varieties. Um, and we can share these later as well. Um, pears, and I have a question mark because there are a lot of people growing apples uh, professionally, commercially here in the Eastern Panhandle. And, but there aren't a lot of people professionally growing pears. And that's because um, of the disease fire blight. And we're gonna talk about diseases in a little bit, but fire blight is so bad that pears just aren't really commonly grown here. However, 
all of these cultivars listed here, this has been an area of research within the past few years to kind of develop disease fire blight resistant pears so that we can grow pears in the mid-Atlantic um, and not have to worry about that disease. Uh, so these also we can show you later, or I can share these slides later, but um, you can try pears. But if you want to grow your typical European pear, like a Bartlett, those are going to get fire blight pretty um, handily. And it's kind of difficult to get out. Um, so I think someone just asked which pear is good for canning, and I'm not exactly sure about that. And I don't have any quince recommendations on here, but I can definitely look those up for you. Sorry, I'll probably save the questions to the end. Um, so when you're actually planting the tree, and this is gonna grow, go for all of your uh, fruit trees, uh, make sure you do not plant the tree so that the graft union is covered. Because if your rootstock is completely covered in soil, Scion cultivar will grow and that tree will end up seedling size regardless. So make sure your graft union is two to three inches above the soil surface. Um, and this is how we, you would do it in a commercial orchard. You just sit on the back of a tractor and then someone, it was probably me in this picture, would just tamp down the soil around your tree and you move on to the next one. So if you had to plant thousands of trees, that's how you would do it. But if you just had planting a few, um, you would dig the hole, place your tree, backfill with soil, um, and it, it's helpful to cover with mulch. However, you definitely don't want that mulch to cover your graft union as well, because that could still in, end up with the scion rooting, and then you'd end up with a huge tree. So you can cover with some mulch, but make sure the grass is smothered and not the tree or the graft union. Um, newly planted trees they need a lot of water. That's a very new environment for them. And they've, if they're bare root, they've been in a lot of grass. So make sure you water well after planting and for several days after planting. Um, and then don't forget to label. One really important thing um, once you plant your orchard, especially if you're doing multiple trees, um, is to make sure that you label because you will forget what you planted. <laughs> um, so you could put a label and I would also make, make a map of your garden. That way you have it in two places and you don't lose it. Um, I think Amanda has raised her hand. I'm not, she can ask a question. Here, I'm good. I will, there we go. Amanda, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, Amanda, what was your question? I'm so sorry, my son hit the button. <laughs> That's, That's okay. okay. Um, Candace, while we're paused, we just have one question. Uh, since you already got past this part, um, how to plan for fruit trees in an urban setting, just two to three, what advice would you give, Deborah? Yeah, I would. Um, I would start with very dwarfing rootstocks. Look for something like a G41 or something like that. Um, if you look up Geneva series rootstocks, it'll give you a chart and it'll give you how like their percentage of standards. So it'll tell you how big they are. Um, so I would get three dwarfing rootstocks and I would stake them at least initially with like a T post. Um, and, and that really should do it. So if you're really concerned about them shading your garden, some apple cultivars are more vigorous than others. So if you look up af apple cultivars, you can find some that don't grow as vigorous. So if you want to be really, really specific, you don't have to do that, of course. <clears throat> um, if you want to do something really cool, you could espalier. And that is, oh, has anyone ever been to Mount Vernon in DC? where they have the fruit trees growing against a wall. Um, you could do something like that. And that takes a lot of patience and pruning. But if you Google it, it's pretty cool. And that would be perfect for urban small space gardening. Is anything else? 
Um, question on the rootstock or the, sorry, the grafting union, if you could talk about that. You might have a picture. I, I saw that, yeah, I wish, I almost wish at the end, if we have time, I will Google a picture of the graft union because I forgot to add one and I really should have, but it'll be, you'll have your roots and then you'll have the top part of your tree and it'll be really visible. Um, it, it looks like pushed together. Um, but once I get through this, if we have time, I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. From and the then just a couple questions on fig trees. Well, I, I didn't add fig trees um, into this, but I know lots of gardeners that have fig trees in the Eastern Panhandle. I have one, it's grown in a pot on my porch. I do know they're much more cold sensitive than a lot of the crops we're talking about today. So. I've seen people cover them with burlap all winter um, to keep them warmer. And I've also talked with uh, gardeners that will keep them in a pot and then either put them in a high tunnel or they'll winter inside. Yeah, yeah. I feel like somebody was talking about growing figs in a high tunnel at one of the one of these extension sessions recently. But. University of uh, Mar Maine has done some research on growing figs in high tunnels. They've had success with it. That would be pretty cool. But we are caught up. Chuck is just giving some um, really helpful tips on, on where to look for the graft union in that first picture. Candace was circling her um, mouse yeah. just around it. It's like right here, <laughs> you can yep. see. I mean, it's not great, but you can, that's where it would be. <laughs> It, it is really hard to miss when you're looking at a tree up close and personal it, it's pretty apparent that it, it almost looks sometimes like it's bulging in a different direction so you can tell that's where the, the difference in the tree on the root stalk's been grafted yeah okay so just some quick orchard management once you get established um it's important to be a good scout, especially if you have a lot of trees. Um, but if you know what's going on in your orchard, you'll know how to solve the problem or you know how to ask somebody how to solve the problem. So if you could get um, some guides on different diseases that you'll see, uh, different insects that might pop up, that can be really helpful. These pictures, um, this one up here, the one with apples and all the leaves. This is just, it looks like an unsprayed tree actually. It's just sooty blotch and fly speck and several leaf diseases of apple. Um, so that apple is diseased, but you can actually eat that. So it's all right. This is tiny little brown marmorated stink bugs right after they hatched. So if you see little baby stink bug, bugs, um, go ahead and smush them. This is a, uh, this is bitter rot in apples, which is uh, another pretty big problem in commercial orchards. So insect identification and management, because this class is so short, I didn't go into a whole lot of details, but just to give you some ideas. Aphids, there are several different types of aphid, aphids, um, and you're gonna see them on all types of fruit trees. The rosy apple aphid is one of the first things to come out on your apple tree, so it causes leaves to really curl up it's not a huge problem unless it takes over and like every leaf is full of rosy apple aphid, um, but it does cause the apples to be misformed. So you don't want a whole lot of this. Insecticidal soaps and neem oil will take care of this, but so will ladybug larva and things like that. So don't, you don't wanna to spray too much in just a home planting because you don't wanna kill your beneficials. Green aphid um, is more of a summer. <clears throat> aphid. It really doesn't, it can stunt your trees, but if you just have a few leaves full of green aphids, it's not really a big deal. And green aphids look similar to this rosy apple aphid, except they're of course green. There are also aphids on peach, which look really similar. And if you guys garden at all, you've probably seen aphids. So it's the same concept. Um, the plum curculio, um, I think I included this one because it's interesting looking and it causes some interesting damage. So usually this is a problem. Uh, it, it's odd because when I would look for this 
while I was scouting an orchard, it would be really bad in some areas and then there'd be none on the other half of the orchard. So it's really variable, <clears throat> but they appear in orchards during bloom, um, right when I think warm 60 degree nights happen. Um, so in apples, these guys will lay their eggs in the apple, but the apple grows so fast, it actually crushes the larva and causes nothing but this little moon shaped scar on an apple. But if you get them in plums, cherries, peaches, um, they can cause a lot more damage. So it's, it's more of an issue. Um, these guys are really hard to kill. So um, I'm gonna talk later about insecticide recommendations and where you can find those. Uh, but these guys are definitely tricky. Um, if you're just growing apples, I wouldn't worry about them because you can eat that scar and it's not a big deal at all. <clears throat> Leaf hoppers, uh, this is, I included this one because it's a problem on young trees, especially if you're interested in growing them organically. And it looks like you have a nu nutrient deficiency, but it's actually from the leaf hopper larva um, sucking juices and good stuff out of those leaves. <clears throat> So it can really stunt the growth of new trees. Neem oil, if you're doing organic, can help. Um, so if you're spraying conventionally, it's not as big of an issue. But it definitely can stunt a young tree if it's not dealt with. Um, if you're thinking about apples, internal worms, of course, are wormy apple uh, is always an issue. So this is actually a problem on peaches and apples, and you know you can have these um, by trapping. So a lot of the orchards in the area will trap for all kinds of internal worms <clears throat> and you're catching the moth version of her, of course, not the worm version. Um, so there are several places you can buy traps. If you just have a small planting, you might end up with a few internal worms, but if you're not growing a large uh, multi-acre orchard, this probably won't be as big of a deal as it is on a commercial scale. <clears throat> but these are the two types of worms that are most prevalent, the oriental fruit moth and the calling moth. Um, it, that's just say calling moth is just apples, it's not peaches, sorry about that. Um, one of these, the oriental fruit moth, it burrows into the calyx or the bottom end of the fruit and calling moth burrows right into the side. So if you see an apple going to the side, you probably have calling moth. If it's at the bottom, you have oriental fruit moth. There are multiple types of worms that can infect your apples. So of course, um, you could see a worm and it won't be either one of these, but these are the two most common. So for peaches, the peach tree pores are a major issue. They of course affect stone fruit, peach trees. <clears throat> and these actually tunnel into the bark around the soil line. And you'll know they're there because there'll be a mass of clear sticky goo coming out from the trunk. Um, and these are pretty difficult to kill without um, heavy insecticides, but if you keep your trees healthy, avoid wounds um, and just keep the base of your tree clear, you can probably avoid them in your home planting. <clears throat> if you do have them, you can actually spray your paint, your, the lower part of your trunk with seven or a pyrethroid insecticide, and that can help with the problem. Um, I realized that wasn't very many <laughs> insects. Um, there are so many insects that affect tree fruit, but I'm going to show you some resources on how you can identify. Um, but this could be a whole class in itself, unfortunately. <laughs> so diseases, same, same with that, a whole class in itself. Um, apple scab is caused by a fungus, and this is the most common disease of apples in the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, um, our whole area, New York. It's a really big uh, issue, and that's why scientists have spent time developing disease-resistant cultivars. So it will infect the leaves and the fruit, um, and, it'll, and it will weaken the tree if it causes defoliation for multiple years in a row. So there is a whole list of, of uh, fungicides you can use to prevent this disease but you can also just use one of the disease resistant varieties we talked about earlier. It also helps to clear out old leaves and chop them with a lawnmower. 
and you can use um, apply urea or fertilizer in the fall and that'll help decompose, like help those leaves decompose and it'll also kill the scab spores. Um, Mancozeb and captan are two fungicides that are used in commercial orchards. Um, you might not want to use them at home, especially if you have the disease resistant cultivars and you don't have to. Uh, neem and copper, I think are labeled for organic, but they, they're, it just doesn't work as well. Um, so this is a, I mean, if you have a few apple scab spots on your leaves, it's not really a big deal at all. Um, the fruit, you can still eat it. It's not all going to look like this scabby thing down here. Um, it's just uh, managing and if you have a little bit, it's okay. <laughs> just go with it. Fire blight, we talked about earlier with pears. It's, um, uh, it infects apples and pears. It's worse on pears, but it is also a problem with apples. If you, oh, I mean, I've seen apple orchards where it all looks like the tree had been on fire because all the twigs had um, fire blight uh, limbs. So the best thing to do when you get these little shepherd's crook infections, just prune it out. Especially if you have a small planting, you can get in there and prune it out um, really quickly. It's important to desanitize your pruners in between if you can. So this is really common in late spring when it first starts getting warm above 65 and when it rains. Um, and it's especially prevalent if it's thunderstorming or hailing and causing damage into those leaves or twigs, the fire blight can get in there. So prune out infected twigs and cankers and just uh, keep an eye out for this disease. You don't, if you don't prune out the cankers, what the disease does is it really will travel all throughout your tree. Um, and, it, and it can infect that tree all the way to the rootstock and eventually kill the entire tree. <clears throat> so make sure you cut out um, the infected limbs as soon as they appear, or as soon as you have a chance. Uh, cedar apple rust. This one, uh, it requires two hosts. So if you have Eastern red cedars next to your apples, that's usually a problem. It could also infect crab apples, hawthorns and quince. Um, I think a long time ago in, in the Eastern Panhandle and in Winchester area, they used to cut down all the red cedars are the eastern red cedars so that they could try to prevent this disease because it's really is a pain once you get it. Those leaves will be yellow the entire season. <clears throat> um, if you do have a cedar tree, you could get in and prune galls before spring. So all these jelly-like orange structures, um, they're before it starts getting warm in the spring and raining, it's just like a black knob and you can actually prune that out of the tree before the season and it won't cause any tr trouble. So this isn't a huge problem unless it's really bad because the infections on the leaves will start infecting the fruit and then you'll get very large yellowy spores, um, spore forming things on your apples um, and you, it's not that appealing. So it's not a huge deal as long as you don't have a lot of it. There are some cultivars that are resistant to cedar apple rust that you can plant. So we talked about this a little bit earlier, brown rot on peaches and plums and cherries. <clears throat> and it's difficult to deal with, especially if it's a wet and rainy spring. It starts with just little brown spots on the blossoms and um, that blossom will just turn into a gummy mess of brown rot material. And every time it rains, those spores spread out to other peaches or cherries around it. So this becomes, um, can be, become quite an issue. <clears throat> so it's helpful to prune out infected twig tissue, uh, clean up mummified fruits and blossoms and improve airflow. But this one is really hard to solve without using a fungicide. Um, <clears throat> so captan is available to home growers, I think, and you could use that, but if you want to start that, every time it rains, you have to reapply, which is, it's a lot <laughs> of spraying. So that's brown rot. Um, so that barely even touched on the number of diseases you would find in 
um, all these tree fruits. So one thing you could do is you could go to the extension office or you could send a picture and we can help you identify. This is a tree fruit field guide that you can buy from, um, I think Cornell Cooperative Extension and we can provide this link for you, but it has a really good, um, it has really great pictures in identifying factors of lots of diseases and in insects. So you can kind of look through that as you're out in the orchard and that can help you identify. <clears throat> um, you are going to expect different pests. So early spring, you have aphids and you have oriental root moth and things like that. And then it changes as you get to the summer. Something that even if you're not a commercial grower, if you buy the spray bulletin, which is put together from extension services from Virginia, West Virginia, Penn State, and I think a couple other um, schools, but they put together a spray bulletin. And what that is, is the official spray recommendations. And even if you don't want to spray, the book really tells you what to expect during bloom and what to expect during petal fall and what to expect late summer. So that could help you identify certain diseases in insects in the orchard. <clears throat> um, and, and Virginia Tech actually does several meetings for commercial growers. And if you're learning, those might be helpful to try to figure out what these commercial growers are looking at and that help you figure out what to do through your home orchard. So there are a lot of resources out there to help you identify um, certain diseases and in insects the one thing to think about is um, if you're not growing in a monoculture orchard, you're going to see completely different stuff than a commercial orchard. So you might see stuff that um, somebody just growing all golden delicious for acres <clears throat> might not see at all. So it might be pretty different. So for fertilizing, um, complete your soil test every two to three years after planting. And you can apply fertilizer once the leaves have fallen or in early spring. Um, apply just an average of about one fourth pound of a 16% nitrogen fertilizer for each year of tree age. And 16%, um, when you buy a packet at the store, it's gonna have that 16 first. So it could be a 16, 16, 16. Peaches need a little bit more than apples and over fertilization will result in excess growth. So these trees don't need a whole lot of fertilizing um, because excess growth means leaves and not fruit. So you don't need a whole lot of nitrogen. Um, I'm gonna go over pruning really, really quickly because this is a very big topic, another session all in itself, but all of these fruit trees can be pruned most successfully in the dormant season. The most important thing to do is take out dead, diseased, and damaged um, <clears throat> limbs. Get all of that out there because that will help you the following year. Remove crossovers. These are limbs that are going right on top of another limb or right back towards the trunk. You definitely don't need that. And 45 degree angles support fruit load. So if you can get your branches to be about 45 degree angles, that's gonna promote fruiting and it's gonna hold the fruit better. It's important to know the difference between a heading and a thinning cut. Heading cuts are when you just chop off the tip, the tip of a branch. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna send three branches in its spot, basically. So you're gonna get a lot of leaves um, and a lot less airflow with heading cuts. So I would encourage you not to use those if at all possible. Thinning cuts are where you take off an entire branch and you're increasing airflow and you're gonna make those other branches grow more. So if you can, um, try to use more thinning cuts. I mean, this is for all types of fruit. This is an example of a heading cut that ended badly. So basically this pruner pruned off the bottom of this branch. Um, I think you guys can see my, my pointer. Pruned off the bottom of it. And this tree responded by sending out a whole bunch of branches. Um, so it looks like actually on this tree, there's been a lot of heading cuts that were not necessary. So try to avoid stopping a cut right in the middle of a branch. Um, as you prune your tree, you can really visualize what's happening. So try to visualize the tree with all of its leaves on and what will happen if you make that heading cut or if you make that thinning cut. 
Um, this is called, this picture is called a bevel cut. And what happens with the bevel cut is a new bud under here will shoot out and create a branch that is more likely to be that 45 degree angle that you want. So um, <clears throat> it's helpful to make bevel cuts instead of like taking it off cleanly, leave that little bit of stuff. Um, and if you have ever pruned or if you've ever gone to an apple orchard and watched someone prune at an extension event, uh, everyone's gonna tell you how to prune differently. So I would encourage you to experiment because everyone has their own sworn way of pruning and they will probably be happy to tell you about it. Um, at least that's been my experience. Uh, peaches are a little bit different because you don't want the central leader, as it's called with an apple or a pear, you want an open shape. So the peaches, if you have the open middle, the fruit has more, you want more um, sunlight in where the fruiting buds are going to be. And that's going to keep that wood inside your vase as fruiting wood instead of just um, branches. So the best thing to do if you have a, a peach tree and it's young and it's just one stick is to head it because then that's going to send out several branches and then you can pick the best ones. <clears throat> so you have an open center with three or four scaffold branches. Um, and peaches are pruned during the dormant season. They're more sensitive to pruning than apples. So if you have apples and peaches, prune your apples first. They don't mind really cold dormant pruning and prune your peaches right before the spring because they it's helpful to not do that because um, they're more sensitive to the cold breezes. Um, wildlife, very quickly, of course this is really difficult. This is my picture for wildlife because that giant tree fell on a deer fence. <laughs> so even your nice deer fences won't always do the job. Um, there are voles. So these are going to be more of a problem in orchards where there are a lot of trees um, and that increases the population of voles. But voles are like these little mice that are outside. You could use um, that are of course in the orchard outside and some of them tunnel underground, some of them are just kind of above the ground, but they will chew on either the roots or the bark of your trees. <clears throat> you can put a hardware cloth covering around the trunk um, and dig it into the ground a bit, but even it's not going to be fail proof. If this is a really big problem, you can use zinc phosphide, which is a rodenticide. Um, just be careful not to use it year after year after year because they will be, <clears throat> they will outgrow it or outproduce it, I guess. Deer, of course, a fence would be the best thing. Um, if you only have a small planting and you're in town, um, you probably don't want to put a fence around just for your apple trees. Uh, you could put a bar of soap. That does work. There's also a fertilizer called melorganite that you could tie in a little baggie on the tree, like a um, mesh baggie, and that keeps the deer away. Um, and I guess if you are in town, I've had a deer in a garden in Town. <laughs> so there are, deer will get to you no matter where you are. Um, so a bar of soap probably wouldn't help just in case, regardless of how large your, your garden is. Um, so that's tree fruit. And I, I'm sorry for taking so much time on that one, but I'm going to briefly go over blueberries and blackberries and raspberries, and then we can have some time for questions uh, and we can talk more about it. You could, you could do a whole beginning gardening series on fruit, I'm now convinced. Um, so site selection for your berries, it's pretty similar to your um, fruit trees. They like full sun. They do well in your vegetable garden conditions. Um, so put them around your um, vegetable beds, around your raised beds. They of course don't like frost pockets or wet spots. And, um, it's best not to keep them in really windy places. I've seen a lot of um, integration of small fruit and landscape plants. This is a blueberry I found today that it called berry bucks and it's made to look like a boxwood. So you can replace your boxwoods with blueberries now, apparently. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, here, if you research it, there are several different charts for spacing. 
Um, this one's from Virginia Tech Extension, but there are just lots of options. I mean, um, there are resources out there to tell you how far apart to plant these things. Um, so blackberries, erect blackberries, five feet between plants, trailing blackberry six. Um, and these things are useful to have when you're planning out um, how many plants you wanna get, how much space you have. This can help you decide um, what to order really if you plan out your space <clears throat> in your garden. Blueberries, there are several different types of blueberries. Rabbit eye, southern high bush, northern high bush and low bush are your options. Um, for warmer climates, rabbit eye and southern high bush are going to perform better. But if you happen to be in West Virginia and in a county like Tucker County, that's a higher elevation, you'd probably do better with the northern high bush. The low bush blueberry is what's commonly grown in Maine that are really, really low to the ground and they, um, the wild blueberries they have there. So just like tree fruit, you need to plant two or more varieties that bloom at the same time <clears throat> for blueberries um, to ensure pollination. So there are several blueberry pollination charts out there as well, just like the apples and the cherries. So this is from, this chart on this page is from Bryant Blueberries and they give you um, what cultivars they have <clears throat> about the fruit, how, um, the size that they grow to, their habit. So you can really pick a blueberry or a couple blueberries since you need a pollinizer um, that fit in your space. So a couple cultivar selections. I picked out some rabbit eye and southern high bush because um, those might do a little bit better in the warmer eastern panhandle. Um, something you can do with blueberries is they also don't ripen at the same time. So you could pick some early ripening blueberries and then later ripening blueberries. So you have a long period um, of harvest. Um, like I mentioned earlier with the tree fruit, there are a lot of similarities. One difference in all of these fruits is blueberries like acidic soil. So I live um, at the top of a mountain in Cave and Bridge and I have really acidic soil. So I don't think I would need to add any acid to my soil to grow blueberries. But they're very shallow rooted and would benefit from irrigation. Um, and they like to have mulch. You just make sure they have proper drainage like all of these fruit crops um, to increase or to decrease the pH and make your soil more acidic. You could use peat moss when planting or pine needles, pine bark, and you can also apply sulfur. You wanna decrease the acidity of your soil. You want to increase the acidity of your soil before planting. Um, so if you're going to add peat moss and pine bark and pine needles to make your pH between 4.2 and 5.2, make sure you're doing it um, six months before you actually plant your blueberries so that your soil is ready for them. Um, blueberries also come as bare rooted plants or you can buy them in the pots similar. You can plant in early spring. <clears throat> Rabbit eye um, are actually taller than high bush blueberries. So plant every four to five feet and 10 feet between rows in northern and southern high bush. Um, plant them every three to four feet and six to eight feet between rows. And you can plant these on raised beds if you want and add your sand and peat and uh, pine bark, pine needles into that raised bed and that'll help with the acidity. Um, blueberry fertilization, um, you don't need to fertilize at planting time, but you can add ammonium sulfate every year afterwards, about two ounces per plant, and then increase as your plant gets larger. <clears throat> you can also use cottonseed meal, um, which provides nutrients and increases the acidity, acidity of your soil so that you have, um, so that you keep that pH where it needs to be for your blueberries. Um, unlike apples, blueberry pruning is simpler. Um, I don't know if that makes me biased, but these you prune during the dormant season um, and they fruit on one year old shoots. So you don't want to take out all of the previous year's fruit shoots, um, but make sure you remove any dead disease and damage and anything that's really low to the ground. Um, just go through these blueberry plants 
um, and leave the best looking shoots and take out the rest. And you want to have 10 to 15 when you're all said and done. And then once you get to the top of your plant, anything that's really weak, take that out so that you have more light and you're focused on the stronger um, branches. So pest issues with blueberries, uh, the birds might get there before you do. So you can use netting um, or I've seen a lot of gardens with aluminum pie plates <clears throat> to keep the birds out. If you have just one small blueberry plant, you might um, hold the netting down with rocks and then get there before the birds do. Uh, spotted wing dystrophila, which is an, this insect is an issue with blueberries and brambles. Um, you want to pick the berries as soon as they are ripe, and it helps to um, pick cultivars that ripen earlier in the summer uh, because the population of spotted wing increases as the season goes on. Um, this insect is interesting because it can infect a berry that has no damage to it. It can lay its, its eggs right into a perfectly fine berry with no damage. Um, but once again, this is probably going to be more of an issue for commercial growers than on the home setting. Um, brambles, whoops. We're going to talk about raspberries and blackberries. So these plants are formed on biennial canes. Um, so two-year-old fruiting canes on most occasions. And they also have perennial crowns, so they live for a long time, send up two shoots that last two years. So brambles like deep sandy loam soils in organic matter. Uh, they fit with your garden plants again with the pH 6.0 to 6.5. They don't like wet feet. So you can play, plant them in late fall or early spring. So all those things are similar for almost every species we've talked about. So when you're planting, <clears throat> Brambles, you can order them bare rooted. And the crown, which is this part, should be about two inches below the soil line when you plant them. Um, here are several variety selections. Blackberries, you can get thornless or with thorns. Um, raspberries, you can get purple, red, black, all different kinds. Your catalogs for bare rooted plants will give you lots and lots of details about which cultivars are which. <clears throat> Um, we're going to talk the Prime Arc 45 and Prime Arc Freedom are first year fruiting uh, varieties um, called primocanes. We're going to talk about that really quickly. So to manage your bramble patch, they like mulch um, and you, they don't really need a lot of fertilizer. You can, point, you can add 0.75 pounds for every 100 square feet, uh, but just do it based on a soil test. Um, and then if you add consistent mulch and that mulch is decaying, it's gonna provide the plants with fertilizer. Um, so just do your soil tests every few years to figure out what you need. <clears throat> there are a lot of different ways to train. Well, there are a lot of just different systems you can use to train these brambles, but you don't really want them training on the ground because then that means your fruit will end up on the ground. So it's important to train them to a wire or keep them contained so they're not falling everywhere. Um, this is a bit confusing, uh, but primocanes and floricanes, primocanes are first year cane. So it's a cane that grew out just this first year. A floricane is one that was here last year and is now back um, for a second year. So there are most brambles are floricane fruiting, meaning they will not fruit on first year wood, but on second year wood. Primocane fruiting or ever bearing will send out shoots and then will produce fruit on those shoots um, in the fall. So primocanes will bear fruit on first year wood. And the pruning um, is really is different for these types. So it's important to know which type you're planting. So when you order plants, write down if they are floricane or primocane. Um, so pruning floor cane bearing, which is second year growth bearing, um, you can prune them anytime from the fall to early spring. The first thing you want to do is if you have a row of brambles is to narrow the row. 
So any canes that are coming out into your aisle or going to be in your way or that you're trip over, just get rid of those. <clears throat> get rid of old fruiting canes. So anything, um, the floor canes that are spent and have already flowered and are done, they will look dead. You'll know the difference and you can take those out. They'll have gray peeling bark. <clears throat> and then thin the remaining canes um, and take out any weak ones. Keep the stronger ones because those are going to produce bigger, stronger berries. Um, and then if you have a primocane fruiting variety, you could um, just remove all the canes during the winter. That would make it really simple because you're going to get fruit the next year because they bear on first year wood. Um, you can soft tip them, meaning in the early spring, just tip prune the very top of your canes and that produces laterals and um, your berries grow on the laterals. So that'll increase the berries. This isn't really recommended, but you can manage a berry patch in a biennial system, um, meaning you follow the directions for floricane fruiting berries, uh, the pruning directions. And then in the summer or in the fall after your primocanes have fruited and you've harvested, you can prune that cane just below where all the fruit was hanging um, and leave it. And that'll grow more fruit the following year. Um, I would, YouTube videos are really helpful with bramble bearing because you could look up exactly what kind of brambles you bought <laughs> because there's differences for erect or trailing, um, all kinds of different fruiting brambles. You can look up pruning directions for those and see an example because pruning is difficult to teach not in person. <laughs> um, that's what I have. Um, like I said, this could be a whole series of classes. So I'm sorry we didn't get to get to all the fruit, <laughs> but maybe next year. Yeah, thank you, Candace. This is a really difficult um, topic to cover, and it's really difficult to cover in like 45 minutes that we normally do in an in-person, let alone an hour and 15 still doesn't seem to touch everything. Um, a few questions in the chat. Sheila asked first, Joanne asked a question. Um, Joanne, it looks like you, you didn't quite finish your question um, regarding the three peach trees that were already on your property. So I'll give you a minute to go ahead and um, put in what you, I think you, you might have missed on the end of that question. But Sheila asks, what can cause fig trees to set fruit, but they don't mature in time? I want, I am not sure, but I wonder if you have a variety that needs more, um, more days. Um, we only have so many days between the first frost and the fall frost. And I if you just have a variety that um, doesn't quite fit in that time period. I, I don't know that much about figs. But that's, that's my, my thought as well. Um, you're not, you don't have quite as enough growing degree days, which is the measurement we use to determine when pests might come out um, based on the temperature and how it adds up over the season. Um, and it also is used for maturity of crops as well. So uh, that's my thought as well. Um, uh, just a couple of things for those of you that want to go in the chat, a couple helpful tips on deterring trees from Paul Elliott. Um, he used to have an orchard and uh, Chuck put some helpful hints on blueberries as well. Um, Sorry, I'm getting that. Deborah um, is interested in table grapes, which is not a topic that we necessarily covered tonight. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I've had people contact me at the Extension Office in Hampshire saying it's kind of an untapped market for Hampshire County that we should do more on table grapes. So maybe we could provide more table grape stuff in the future. Deborah, are you interested in varieties and just general growing information like we didn't get to you tonight? I'd be happy to send you some stuff through email. Um, and Stefan asks, I'm looking at chestnut. I was wondering how well the Chinese chestnut will do. I planted one last year, <laughs> but um, I, I, I'm not sure about that. I've heard some people um, just from gardeners around saying that they grow for a few years and then don't do so well. Um, but I, I don't know. What about you, Emily? Do you, have you... I don't know much about 
any of the nuts, to be honest, <laughs> Stefan. Um, Deborah wants to know, does she need, for pollination of grapes, does she need two different varieties? Yeah, you need two of those. You can look up a chart for those as well. Deanna asked, um, she planted three trees in a row, apple, plum, and cherry. The cherry has never grown any fruit. Um, what advice do you have, or is it too late? They're about 20 years old. Does your cherry bloom? She says no. Oh. Did you, Deanna, did you do a sweet cherry or a tart cherry? I think they bloom at separate times. Tart. Hmm. I'm I don't I'm not sure about about the cherries. Yeah, I just yeah. answered a question very similar to this um the other day. I believe a and I could be completely mixed it. I think a, a cherry needs another cherry. If I I think that's right, but don't quote me on that, Deanna, but I'll look that up for you and, and get you that info. Yeah. They I don't I don't know why it's not blooming though. That's odd. Um, and just one from John, is it common for peach trees to produce fruit every other year? We have two peach trees that are about five years old. They produced a lot of fruit two years ago and very little fruit last year, although the trees were healthy, they just didn't produce any fruit last year. And we had a really late frost last year. Yeah, peaches, um, apples can be very biennial where they grow a lot of fruit one year and then nothing the next year. Um, I don't think that's very common for peaches, but I do know um, if the frost got them, that's probably a reason to lose all the fruit or in, in flowers. Yeah, and in these past five years, we've had some really strange weather. I mean, we had really wet weather. We had really late frost. So no offense, John, but I think you picked just a pretty off time to, to get into the, um, the peach trees. So hopefully we start seeing some regular season yeah we're, we're i hope we're done with the cold weather <laughs> <laughs> i hope so as well if there's no other questions then i guess that that wraps it up thank you candace you it's very clear that you have a lot of knowledge on this topic so i really appreciate you taking the time to share it and i can just hear how enthusiastic you are when you talk about tree fruit so that's always really appreciated <laughs> this is actually the first time i've got to talk about it since i started at extension so it's exciting. <laughs> well we'll be having you back <laughs> Well, everybody, um, have a wonderful rest of your evening, and hopefully we see you next week.